So we're continuing our series on who is Jesus. The first part of the series, we had eight, eight messages, eight talks on why we should trust in Jesus. And the last eight are why don't we trust in Jesus. And, to, and so tonight's um, talk is on how the love of money and the love of possessions presents an obstacle from us to to trust Jesus, to know Jesus, to love Jesus, to follow Jesus, the love of money and the love of possessions. And I think this is a particularly important um, topic for those of us living in a very materialistic culture centered around uh, consumption. So this has been really characteristic of of America since its beginnings. The uh, Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville in the 1830s observed this about Americans. We never attain as much as we desire. It seems like we can see the charms of prosperity and pursue those aggressively, but they are always too far away, so we never acquire them. And that we die before we can taste the delights of these charms of prosperity. And he observed what he called a strange melancholy that haunted um, not just Americans, but people that people that lived, what he called people that lived in democracies that were affluent, democracies that had a lot of money. Two years ago, a South Korean philosopher named Byung-Chul Han uh, it's a professor out of Berlin University, he wrote a book called Capitalism and the Death Dive. He's not a Christian, um, and I, I believe that he is actually a communist. And uh, so he's got, a, he's, got, he's got a whole series of books on all of the problems of modern, affluent Western culture. And so he's got a book on, on money and affluence and, and blames capitalism which I see as greed. Capitalism is not greed, but anyway. So he says that if we were to do a a deep exploration of our collective psychology, it would reveal what he calls an archaic belief. Um, The belief that the more assets we accumulate, the more we can hold off death. So the wealthier we are, the more life more eternal life we will have. He said we are blinded in this pursuit of assets and it is killing us. So what we actually believe deep down is going to give us more life. He's arguing that it's actually killing us. And so we should ask the question, um, are we blinded to the charms of prosperity And are we destined to this strange melancholy that haunts affluent cultures? And so this is a familiar story in the Bible. This is the the story where Jesus uses this metaphor of the camel going through uh, the eye of a needle. And there's no gate in ancient Israel that was called the eye of the needle. He's actually talking about a real camel and a real eye of the needle. And so the story is fairly simple. And again, probably most of us are familiar with it. So the rich ruler comes and he asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, well, you know the commands. And he lists off about five of the commands. And the rich young ruler, uh, excuse me, Luke doesn't call him the rich young ruler. That's in another one of the gospels. So it's a rich ruler. And the rich ruler says, "I, I have been faithful to all of those commands. But Jesus says, well, you still lack something. You need to sell all of your possessions and then give give the proceeds to the poor, and then you need to follow me. Well, at this point, the ruler becomes very sad, the text says, very distressed, for he was an extremely rich man. And I can't help but think, is this the melancholy He's after eternal life, and Jesus has just told him that he can't have it unless he gives everything away, so his riches clearly aren't making him happy. And then Jesus declares how hard it is for those with possessions 
to enter the kingdom. And it's important to understand the term here used for rich and wealth is actually the term for possessions. It's not just this general idea of being rich. It's they have a lot of stuff. Which is why then those who are in the crowds, they say, well, well then who can be saved? Because everybody has possessions. If Jesus is saying it's hard for anybody with possessions to enter into the kingdom of God, the question is, well, we've all got some possessions. We may not be considered rich, but we've got possessions. Who can be saved if it's hard for those with possessions to enter into the kingdom? At which point Jesus says, well, what's impossible for man is possible with God. And then Peter and the disciples that are there with him say, well, we have left everything, Lord Jesus, to to follow you. And Jesus says, well, then everybody who has given up their homes, their families, to, for the sake of the kingdom will have multiple, uh, will have those things multiplied in this age and eternal life in the age to come. So that's the story. That's the story. And so we see here, and when we're asking the question, what prevents us from trusting in or what prevents us from following Jesus, we can see the problem. And then there's a promise, and then there's power to take hold of that promise. So we're going to go through what the problem is with money and possessions. We're going to see the promise that Jesus gives in order to inherit eternal life, even with possessions, and then the power it is to fulfill that promise that Jesus makes, to take hold of it. Because it's a power, as Jesus said, that we as humanity do not possess. It's got to come from God. So what is the problem? The problem for the ruler is that he can't let go of his possessions. So if we see the context of the passage, there there are two subtle things that gives us some insight into the problem that the rich ruler has. We can obviously, he can't get rid of his possessions. He doesn't want to get rid of them. But there's two subtle things that helps us see maybe what the deeper problem is. The first one is the context of the passage. So the other, there are other stories around this one in this area, this part of Luke. And they're dealing with the problem of self-righteousness. People that think that they can justify themselves through their own efforts. People that think that they can become a, a full happy, complete human being, not only for themselves, but all their interactions with the world, they think that they can become their ideal self on their own and be approved on their own. And so there's there's a couple of stories ahead. There's There's a Pharisee that looks down upon a tax collector, and the Pharisee is 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 in the temple, he's thanking God. God, I thank you so much that I am not like him. And then you have the the tax collector asking and pleading God for mercy because he sees his own weakness and he sees his own sin. The other thing is that Jesus doesn't mention the command, do not covet. He lists the commands that are a little more easy to maybe observe and check off. But he doesn't mention do not covet, but it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And the ruler didn't correct Jesus or say, hey, what about the the command, Jesus, do not covet? The ruler just says, all of the commands you've just said, I have followed. And it's important to see these two things. So there's something going on, because we're supposed to read this passage thinking, Luke, in writing this, is addressing self-righteousness And so there's something about having possessions that gives us a sense of self-righteousness or that we're okay without without Jesus. And we're supposed to see that coveting wasn't brought up. Now, coveting is a strong desire to acquire more and more material possessions or to possess more things than other people have which really fits into the self-righteousness because whenever there is self-righteousness, there is division. Throughout the New Testament, when when the apostles are dealing with self-righteousness, 
When apostles are dealing with those who want to create laws that define righteousness and they're not Jesus' instructions, it's things like what you eat or don't eat, what you drink or don't drink, or how you celebrate this or that, or whether you get circumcised or not, or follow the Sabbath. They create laws because there are people that do a really good job in following rules. And so those kinds of people will set up these rules to distinguish themselves from those who can't follow rules so well. And so that creates, because you can see that you're better than others, that creates this sense of self-righteousness. Just like the Pharisees saw the tax collector, and just like rich people see other people who do not have the same amount of possession. So, so coveting is used to develop a sense of self-righteousness. The Apostle Paul equates coveting with greed and idolatry. And, I, and, and idolatry is the worship of things that we believe gives us life. Idols are false gods, but we have things that we posture in our lives that are essentially gods because we believe that they're going to make us happy, secure, good, fulfilled, complete as human beings. And so this ruler believes that possessions bring him life, possessions give give him a sense of being right and true and fulfilled and complete, and possessions set him apart from others. So we have to ask the question, well, why does he go to Jesus in the first place? And he asks the question, what must I do for eternal life? Is he really wanting eternal life? Or does he think that maybe he's already got it and he just wants Jesus to affirm it? Or is there, clearly, he thinks maybe there's, there's something that he can do. Either way, we see that he's either thinking that he's already got it or that it's something that he can do to acquire it, probably th through possessions or riches. But he goes away sad. He goes away sad because Jesus either doesn't tell him what he wants to hear, oh, you already have eternal life. Or he doesn't, and Jesus doesn't tell him something to do. Except sell everything you have. Everything that you've done to acquire all you have is worthless. Those things are worthless. You need to give those things up, and then you won't be lacking what it takes for eternal life. So that's, that's the problem. The problem of coveting, the, co the problem of greed. But there's also another problem. There's a blindness. You can't see it. And Jesus exposes it because he's unwilling to give to the poor. He's unwilling to take what he has and give it, sell it and then give the proceeds to the poor. It's very likely that he didn't associate very often with the poor, again, which is a characteristic of self-righteousness. You, you separate yourself from those that aren't like you. I was listening to a, a Tim Keller a sermon on, on money, and he said, you know, greed doesn't have a, a particular sin that you can just point out, a particular behavior that you can just point out, like, like the sin of adultery, okay? It's pretty clear when you've committed adultery or if you've lied or stolen something. Greed is not that way, which is why it's actually the last commandment. In the, in the Ten Commandments, it's the last one because it, it kind of ties together the beginning, which is you shall worship no other gods, and the end, which is protect yourself from the idolatry of coveting. So, Greed and coveting, again, doesn't have a specific behavior. It's of the heart. Rich people can be greedy. Poor people can be greedy. If you're poor and you're greedy, and you're, or if you're poor and you believe that material possessions are the means of happiness and righteousness, just because you have them doesn't mean uh, excuse me, just because you don't have riches doesn't mean that's not where your heart's at. You're probably angry and bitter because you don't have them. Just like the rich people that have them are, are arrogant and self-sufficient. So you can be rich, you can be poor, and still be greedy, you can still be coveting. And so the exposure 
to people outside of our economic class is one of the ways that you can observe whether or not you're greedy. When you are around people in need that don't share your same wealth, how do you respond? Do you go away like the rich ruler did? Or do you say, hey, what can I do to share what I have? Because that's what Jesus said. The, the poor were there. The rich ruler just walked away. And so his, his, how he dealt with and how he thought of his possessions reflected where he was at, but also his emotions. He became very sad. He became very distressed. So regardless of the reason that he was sad, so obviously he didn't, follow, he didn't want to follow what Jesus told him, but his state of being sad, very sad and very distressed, reflected that even though here's a man with possessions, the possessions didn't give him a sense of confidence enough to be able to stand there with Jesus and remain happy. Jesus undermined the confidence that he had in his possessions. The possessions no longer provided him a place of contentment and happiness. It didn't mean he was ready to get rid of them, but it had been exposed. And so the problem, of the man, the problem is that the man was greedy and idolatrous of his material possessions. The problem was that he was blinded to it. He was blinded to it. This uh, South Korean ph philosopher, uh, Bin Chul Han, says this, says, humankind is blighted by a deadly blindness. He says, we can only recognize the simpler orders of organization. Regarding higher orders, we are blind as bacteria. So when he says, when he says these, these orders of organization, political life, economic life, things that we need to do to just stay alive and be profitable, we get those really well. We're blinded to a higher orders that direct us to a political life and an economic life that would actually make us happy, that would actually bring us true life. He says those things are divine, and we are completely blinded to it, and that's what's killing us. That's what's killing us. We are greedy, and we are blind to it. So the promise then... so. What Jesus does is he, is he makes a promise that refers to a higher order of how we think about and use material possessions. If humanity just in its basest sense is just organizing itself for profit, there's a higher way to think about material possessions. And Jesus says this, sell all you have and give it to the poor and obtain a treasure in heaven. Then at the end, no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So Jesus is trying to point all who hear to a higher order, a different way of thinking about money and material possessions, where profit is not the only goal, but the purposes and the sake of the kingdom. And so there's just... Jesus really refers to a short-term investment and a long-term investment. Because he's talking about the here and now, the age here and now, in this time, and in the age to come. So the short-term investment is this. You, you follow me, you release your idolatry of material possessions, and follow me, and you're going to become a part of a family. Know what, know what Jesus says. No one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children. Those are all things about home. Those are all things about family. And what he's saying is that you're going to have a sense of having to give up everything for me. But the things that you think you're going to be giving up, well, the things you are going to be giving up to follow me, you are going to receive many times more when you come into my family. You want the intimacy and closeness and friendship of people and all of the, a sense of belonging, a sense of place, a sense of security, a sense of purpose. You come into my family and you will be overwhelmed with those things. And you will not only enter into all of these things that a family provides, you're going to come into the resources of a family. 
You're going to come into the, the financial resources of a family. You're going to have more in the family of God than you trying to make it on your own, scraping by, thinking only about profit. You're going to have more. Not only in this age, but in the one to come. And being in this family then is a check on coveting and greed. See, when you're in the family of God, you, we are representing a lot of different socioeconomic, ethnic, we are not all the same. And one of the things that, that bringing all of us into a family does is it puts us into interactions with one another. And you see this throughout the New Testament, where people in need in one geographic setting or one, one church, those who had more in another context, shared with those in order that everybody would, would have enough. And that is, that is the principle that works in the family of God. It is a check on greed and coveting because when a need comes up, we there as people in the kingdom of God exposed to the need, we can't walk away like the rich ruler. James says if you're presented with somebody who's in need of food or clothing or shelter and you just walk away, James says you have no faith. You have no faith. When you're in the family of God and you're presented with a need, you meet the need. And that's how you know that material possessions aren't your God. When you're freely ready to give them up to meet the needs of the church family, Jesus' family, the kingdom. First Timothy reflects this as well. He says, those are, instruct those who are rich in the world to do two things. Enjoy what God has given them and be engaged in good works, ready to share with those who are in need and be ready to share with generosity. The enjoying goes hand in hand with the sharing generously. Ecclesiastes, we're going through this as a, the young adults class. Throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes, it's really cool. One of the principles that he states explicitly is this. The more you love money and possessions, the less you're going to be able to enjoy them. The more you love them, the less you're able to enjoy them. You want to enjoy material possessions? Seek God and keep his commands, and God will bring happiness to you as you share those with the family. That's where happiness comes from. It comes from God. We do not have an ability. This is what de Tocqueville observed. This is what this South Korean philosopher, I can't pronounce it every time without looking at it. It's, it's what he observes. We are not happy. We are not happy. Happiness comes from God, not worshiping material possessions. And then the long-term investment, enjoying God's presence and his people for eternity. We're in the family of God. We are enjoying God's presence. There's no need anymore for material possessions. We'll be on earth. We will have physical bodies. There will be buildings yeah, there will be material things, but material possessions in terms of like acquiring money to buy things in order to eat, no, that's not going to exist anymore. We will be in the presence of God. We will be together as his family. And God will be flooding us with life, with eternal life. And there's no action on our part that opens the door to that kingdom. Hey, these are, again, these are the higher orders. This is how we need to be thinking about our, our money and our material possessions. What do we, how do these go for the purposes of the kingdom of God? How do these go? Because that, then we will be able to experience what righteousness is. And that's what's going to define the kingdom of God, righteousness. We can't get it on our own. We're going to have it in the kingdom. And we're going to have it in life with Jesus' people. Now, this call to the ruler, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow them, that's not everybody's call, and I'm sure we'll have a question more on that when the, when the Q&A time comes up. The calling is to live in this higher order. So the problem is that we're greedy and we don't see it, 
The promise is that we can live with our material possessions according to a higher order that really does bring life, that really does bring a sense of contentment. So the question then is, well, what can break our greed? What can break our blindness? If humanity can't do it, like Jesus said, like this rich ruler demonstrates, how do we break it? Well, then that's the power. It's only possible, Jesus says, it's only possible with God. You can't squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle. It's an impossible thing to do, but it's something that God can do. And he first does this by an example. So God the Father, for a time, gave up his son. And then that son, Jesus, he gave up his home. He gave up riches beyond our comprehension or our ability to articulate. All right, the glory of read the book of Revelation, and you say, This is what Jesus left beauty and power and glory. Jesus left it to come to earth as a baby. So they broke apart their family. Jesus left riches and glory. Jesus entered into the poverty of humanity as a baby. He was homeless, he was poor, he became an outcast, and then he was killed. So Jesus is following the higher order of what it means to be in the kingdom of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 says, this was in Jesus' nature to do this. It's God's nature to give away in order to give life to others. And in doing that, he also demonstrated and showed by his example that he fulfilled what he just promised. What did he get when he... he, he died and then was resurrected. And in his resurrection, he was appointed king of the entire creation. He obtained all of us. One of the things that, that we are to pray for understanding of is the treasure that we are to Jesus as his inheritance. He inherited us because he went to the grave and resurrected, now sits at the Father's right hand, we become his inheritance. We become his possession. He obtained a family, an eternal global family that he could share his wealth with, which is the other thing that we're called to pray. God, help me to understand the riches of the glory of Christ and how valuable we are to him. He gained authority over the nations. He gained an eternal kingdom. So by example, Jesus was operating and showed, yeah, the higher order works. The higher orders of the kingdom of God works. But then also through faith in the promise, he gives that power to us. Christ's life for us. Do we want to share in Jesus's eternal life? then we believe who he is, we believe what he did and what he's done for us and what he says he's going to do for us. If we believe that, we're baptized into Jesus' death so we can die to the world and it's, its blindness to coveting and greed. And then we can raise from the dead into Jesus' life. We are one with him. So we share Jesus' position and authority over the over the nations, we sit at Jesus' right hand with him. Excuse me, at the Father's right hand with Jesus. We are called his co-heir. So we inherit what Jesus inherits. He gives us that power through his Holy Spirit to experience eternal life. He did it by his example, showing that the eternal kingdom order works. And he gives us the power to do it through faith in him and the Holy Spirit that he gives us and our baptism into his death and into his life. Let me pray real quick. God, thank you for giving us the power to, to live the promise of eternal life, of having many times more in this age and in the one to come through your promises. God, thank you for giving us the ability to see and repent of 
of our greed. We pray, God, that you would help us to, to believe in the higher order that you have in Jesus Christ and to take hold of that power in the gospel. In your son's name we pray. Amen.